start off, uh, I have to give this formal introduction, but hopefully we're going to have a very informal conversation uh, with Maggie uh, in, in a couple of minutes or so. I do have to say that uh, at 12.20, I have to leave for a few minutes, but then we'll come back afterwards. My meeting is not a commentary on the quality of the discussion. <laughs> so, uh, greetings. For those of you who don't know, I'm Irv Epstein, and uh, before proceeding, I want to uh, formally thank the Mellon Foundation, Recentering the Humanities Grant Program, the Center for Human Rights and Social Justice, the History and Philosophy Departments, the Chaplain's Office, the 3D Series, the International Film Series, the Library, and the Provost's Office for making uh, Maggie Renzi's visit possible. This has been a collective effort throughout the university. Uh, Maggie Renzi is a renowned actor and producer uh, whose work has been honored through nomination by the Independent Spirit Awards, Black Rim Awards, the Satellite Awards. She's the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the St. Louis International Film Festival, and the Storyteller Award from the House Talking Picture Festival. In addition to acting in many of John Sayles' films, she's produced most of them, along with the critically acclaimed film Girl Fight, and a number of Bruce Springsteen videos, including Born in the USA, Glory Days, and I'm on Fire. The dedication, intelligence, and creativity that are essential to producing some of the most influential films of our lifetimes are unique characteristics that most of us can only aspire to apply. But all of these accomplishments, as numerous and impressive as they are, in and of themselves don't do justice to this person. Maggie Renzi is wise, kind, and courageous, displaying <laughs> qualities that speak of her liberal arts background and her commitment to the arts and through the arts, furthering our understanding of what social justice entails. We're deeply honored to have her in our presence, and she's agreed to answer questions you may have about the nature of film production of this welcome anyway. I'm going to sit on this. It is um, extraordinary and very nice to be uh, honored and invited to come and talk to you because of who I am. Um, I'm 62, no, 63. I just turned 63. <laughs> And uh, that's long enough in my life to have something to sum up. And um, one of the nice summations is that I'm considered, spending time with me is considered worth your time. Um, you're very good to spend it to me, with me over lunch. I, I could talk about a million things. Um, but the sh very short thing I want to tell you is that uh, I have since 1978 been making movies. I've uh, produced 14 of the 18 with John and a few other ones by some friends in, in a smaller way. And it's taken me all around the world. It's taken me outside of the little town in Massachusetts where I grew up. And it's taken me into encounters with people that I just never imagined that I would ever know outside of books or movies. So I've worked in um, the hills in West Virginia. I've worked in Harlem, USA. I've worked in Alaska and Florida. I've worked in um, Alabama and Ireland, in Mexico, in uh, Indiana, but never actually Illinois. Although we did do eight men out uh, in Indiana to pretend it was Chicago. Uh, usually we make movies in the places where the story really happens. And that's been an incredible opportunity to get to know people where they live. I've, I've gotten over being scared of meeting strangers because um, meeting strangers and enjoying their company is a lot of what making these movies on location has been about. What it's done is ruined me entirely as a tourist. If I can't have somebody to show me around Blooming in, uh, Bloomington, Illinois, I probably won't go to Bloomington, Illinois. Today we just had a great tour of your city. Um, by two historians who taught me more about this place than I've ever thought there was to know. Um, so please, uh, some of you are film people and we can talk about movies or Illinois.
Yes. Thank you for asking a question. So how was your day? <laughs> my day was good. It was a little cold. Um, but uh, Mike Mech, Mech, Matika um, and Greg Kuz took us around town this morning. And, uh, you know, you go to a town and think, oh, something used to happen here. Can't quite tell what used to go on. Saw the big state farm sign. Even that's on Wikipedia. I could tell about the town. But learned a lot about Lincoln, how he learned to clean up here and become a presentable candidate here. So my day was good. And yours? Mm. <laughs> Did you have a class already? Yes. And the class was about? Accounting. Accounting. Cool. <laughs> it's important. John Sales. What, what does a movie producer do? It's interesting how often that question is asked. Uh, what does a movie producer do? You know, now when you look at a movie, you see maybe 10 credits up front saying, Two executive producers, three producers, produced by several companies, two co-producers, a couple of associate producers, a line producer. We make independent films. That means that we don't. We make them outside a corporate system. And uh, what's what you what strikes you in seeing our early movies is there's the one, maybe two producers. Often I worked with a partner. Um, I think a producer does everything that no one else really wants to follow through with. So my job is to make sure that all the jobs are being completed and that I've hired the right people to do that. Uh, it's a little bit like being the mother in a way that's not altogether great um, because whenever, you know, whatever, the, the kids don't have shoes or, or without their lunch or whatever, it's what kind of a mother are you? <laughs> and I take that responsibility pretty seriously, but sometimes it's exhausting. Uh, my, my job, very specific to the movies that we do, is to serve John's vision. So sometimes I get to help him choose what movie we're going to make. We made a beautiful movie called The Secret of Rowan Inish. Does any of you know that? That's a, a movie set in Ireland based on a children's book that I read maybe 50 times when I was little. And I encouraged John to make a movie of that, and after about five years of my pestering him, uh, he did. He did. It's a great movie. But most of the time, John chooses a subject, and my job is to help it be uh, possible to actually make it. Sometimes that means I raise the money. Sometimes it means I ask him to change the script in ways that we don't have to raise quite as much money. Um, and often my job more and more is um, marketing and distributing the films, which are two things that really don't interest me at all and I find uh, tedious. <coughs> the business has changed a lot, and so what the producer has to do is just more and more and more. But saying all that said, I'm so glad I don't have to work in Hollywood where I wouldn't get nearly the um, autonomous power that I have, where I only have to defer to the director. How difficult was it to get your first The question is how difficult it was to get our first movie produced and how has it changed now? The first movie was uh, produced with um, reckless ignorance. It was a little bit like Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney saying, hey kids, let's put on a show. My mom can sew and your dad's got a barn. And it was called Return of the Secaucus 7 and we made it in 1978 for $40,000 with a bunch of our friends. And it's a, it's a weekend reunion movie which was uh, blatantly and very successfully um, inspired uh, The Big Chill by Larry Kasdan uh, a couple of years later. That movie was made before there was uh, uh, the, the expression, the category American independent film, though there were other people who were making independent films at that time. But it really captured the imagination in the country and when, for example, Time Magazine and Newsweek were important magazines, our, this little teeny movie was reviewed. And it came out because there were a couple of film festivals that really mattered. One of them in Los Angeles called Filmex doesn't exist anymore, but the Museum of Modern Art uh, has a, in New York City has a film program called New Directors, and it was chosen for New Directors. It's still a very important launch for any film to get to go into New Directors. You mostly probably just hear about Sundance Film Festival and maybe South by Southwest, which is in Austin, um, which is just wrapping up this week. 
Um, but the Museum of Modern Art is another important one. So this little bitty movie that we made with a bunch of friends that we thought maybe would play on PBS ended up at these two important film festivals and in a moment when there was a lot of excitement about movies, which I have to say is a quite different excitement than there is now, um, because people were discovering movies. They weren't having movies sold to them. Any movie that you go to in the theater right now has a conservatively a budget of $10 million advertising it to you. You may think you found that movie, discovered that movie, but it's really being heavily promoted to you with a lot of money behind it. It used to be less true. People had a loyalty to a cinema, for example. You just go there and think, oh, well, whatever they're playing at the normal is something that I'll probably like. Um, and that came out of, a, of a, an earlier interest, a, a strong, cultural, compelling interest in this country um, to go to see movies from other countries as well, not just the Hollywood movies, but to see French movies and Japanese movies. And, and our movie kind of fell into that, sort of a foreign movie. It had no movie stars. I'm in it. John's in it. Nobody you know. Well, now you know some people who are in it. Uh, did any of you see Good Night and Good Luck? which is about Edward R. Murrow. Oh, a wonderful movie. Our friend David Strathairn is in that. You'd recognize him from some other, um, other movies. Uh, he was in Lincoln. He plays Seward in Lincoln. But we were all unknowns in it. And the remarkable thing about Secaucus 7, if you see it, is um, that they all look just like you. They all look like they wore normal clothes, and because we were wearing our own clothes. and and talk like normal people. And before that, it was all, you know, women, women with pointy bras and lots of lipstick when they go to bed. And, you know, do I remember feeling that way about seeing movies, like, how do they, how do they wear those 90s, you know? And how does their hair look like that at night? And so Caucus 7, I think, is part of, um, was, was very much in this, um, this change of what, what, what you would start to see in a, in a, on a screen, which is that they weren't just heroic, they weren't just perfect. We sort of moved back from that now, but in the independent um, cinema, you still see people who kind of look like people. Yes? I've had a lot of people approach you and uh, kind of talk to you into making movies about their favorite subject. So I was just wondering if you could come and make a movie about the Illinois Wesley and the students. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, joking aside, I, we're very grateful uh, to have you uh, folks come here. And I wonder if you might uh, I invite you to talk about your experience uh, now that you're here with our students on a, a liberal arts campus, your own college experience, uh, and just kind of reflect on the things that were part of your college experience that have helped shape uh, your great career and the things you do now and the things you've done over the years. I, I was really lucky, and I think that John would say the same thing. We went to Williams College, which is a small college in western Massachusetts. I'd actually grown up in that town, and it was like a beacon for me of when you get out of high school, when you finally get out of high school, you're going to get to go to college, and you get to make your own decisions and lead your own life. And So I went uh, to Barnard College, which is the Women's College of Columbia, and uh, I hated it. No one was going to class. It was 1969, which was right after the student revolutions of 1968. And our Barnard College was just a whole bunch of really pissed off, really smart girls who, who didn't hang together and there was no community and there was no campus. And so after two years I left and I returned to the town that I grew up in and went to Williams College. And partly what I was missing at, at, at uh, Barnard was that I had been an actress since I was a small kid. My father was one of the people who started this really good summer theater in my little town. It's called the Williamstown Theater Festival. And so I started acting when I was eight. I was a very famous Helen Keller when I was 10. And, I, and then I continued to act in um, high school plays and also plays at the college. So I, when I went to Barnard, I thought, well, I'll just keep acting. And it was kind of a closed shop. They used uh, professional actors and lots of the roles. And so when I came back to Williams, the very first place I went was to the theater. And th that theater um, was a sort of, I was talking about it earlier with Irv, because you would know several of the actors that have been in our um, movies. Gordon Clapp, is that a familiar name? He was in, um, which is the NYPD, NYPD forever. Um, and David Strathairn and John 
were all uh, refugees in the green room uh, at the theater. And it gave shelter to all kinds of oddballs and renegades, myself included. Not all people like I who are already interested in theater, but just people who needed a clubhouse, just a place to, to hang out and find their tribe. And I think that for me, that's really one of the, the my long journeys were leaving my nuclear family, leaving my town, and finally finding my tribe. My tribe now turns out to be global and has something to do with film. It's the people I've worked with on films. You can imagine you work with about 100 people when you make a movie. And I've made 14 movies, so that's a lot of new potential friends. And then we've been on this amazing film festival circuit since 1980, um, getting invited to you know, Rotterdam and um, San Sebastian in Spain and Dublin and Tokyo and all around the world, meeting people who are like us all around the world. And when people say to me they want to be filmmakers, I, what I want to say is, may you be as lucky as I am to get to be part of this roving international tribe and to travel uh, well above our financial means into the hands of, of uh, welcoming hosts has been really one of the best parts of it. For me, I have to say that classes mattered at, when I was in college, but what mattered the most was being around people who were interested in things that I didn't know anything about yet. So I think the students were among the people that I really learned from. Now we go a lot to campuses, we talk a lot of campuses now, because the films are about something, so they end up being taught in all these different disciplines. Uh, John was honored in the last, we have been honored in the last couple of years by the American Studies Association, the American History Association, the Modern Language Association, and that's in recognition that the films are being taught in all these different disciplines because um, they're really about something. I think what a liberal arts college does is make let you know that there's a giant course book of things to be interested in, and if you're lucky you don't have to hurry, and you can make your way through the whole book. I have a nephew who went to uh, uh, University of Michigan Musical Theater Conservatory. He's very successful. He's on Broadway, just opening this week in Gigi. But we talk sometimes about what he missed out on how narrow a vocational training that was for him. And uh, for me, liberal arts just remains like the greatest buffet you can have, with the possibility that you'll meet somebody from a discipline completely different than yours, um, and learn something from them and make a different friend. I'm all about friends, basically. <laughs> and not everybody is. It took me a long time to discover that. But for me, I'm all about friends and where they live and what they have to say, which is probably also why I care about history. Everybody's connected. Yes? So from this uh, liberal arts background, how did you transition into like, uh, the aspects of like, filmmaking like, for both of you, like direction and like, producing? Um, like, did you have a kind of like, in-between phase of training, or did you just straight and jump into it? And like, has it ha have times changed in the Yeah, neither John nor I went to film school. I so wish I'd gone to that accounting class that you went to this morning, however. I could have, I could have used a little more background, honestly, to, to, to go from being an actress, sort of, to a businesswoman with no training at all in between, was, um, I tied my hands a bit, and maybe insecure and made me have to depend too much, I think, on my colleagues. I'm the, uh, the best delegator you'll ever uh, uh, meet. But I think partly the delegation had to happen because I really wasn't as um, informed as I need to be. Now, after so many years of it, I can look at a budget, I can look at a contract. I wouldn't have minded, you know, uh, honestly not much more than about a week-long seminar in budget building. Uh, we have a friend who does a really great one named Richard Gay, and if you go, it's G-U-A-Y, and if you go, he has a really nice blog, which is, in which he does a, a webinar, and I keep thinking I'm going to settle down and take his before I make the next movie, but I don't know if I really will. Um, John didn't go to film school either. He was a psychology major at Williams College, and, um, and essentially just trying to stay out of the Vietnam War by continuing to be a student. 
and he uh, got a C average, which he calculated very carefully, did as, absolutely as little work as he possibly could. He's the worst role model for students. <laughs> but he also had this rare, rare, rare vocation. So he read every single thing he wanted to in the fiction section of the library up to the letter P. <coughs> That's what he did for four years and played some pool and watched Jeopardy, as far as I can tell. <laughs> but he's a real autodidact, somebody who really has extraordinary discipline. He decided he wanted to make a book, uh, write, write a book called, that's called Los Cusanos, about Cuban Americans. And so he decided he had to learn Spanish, and so he did. Um, the rest of us are just talking about all those things that we ought to do, and John really does them. So I think school gave him um, a safe place to be out of the war, and a sort of legitimate place to be out, out uh, to be. But um, he took one film class there, which was a film criticism class. Um, that was uh, they where for one month they studied all the films of the great Swedish director Ingmar Bergman. Uh, there, uh, there's certainly good things about studying film. I don't think there's anything better than actually watching really a lot of films and making sure that for every contemporary film you watch, you watch three that were made before uh, 2000, because there's an incredibly rich uh, catalog of wonderful films and wonderful experiences, and it's too easy not to go there because everything more contemporary is being promoted to you, and, and of course it's fun to visit your old friends, but honestly, how many times can you see, I don't know, spring break, whatever. No, that's out of date. Let's see, <laughs> what's the movie that you love the most right now? The one that you'd, you'd, you'd watch again if anybody put it on in your... Frozen. Frozen. <laughs> and you can sing along, which is so nice, yeah. No, I, there's a place for that, for sure. For sure. I think, um, I'm trying to think what does that to me. Well, a couple of ours do that to me, I have to admit. If, if our movie Lone Star is on TV, I just end up sitting down and watching it again. And I pretty much feel that way about Secret of Rowan Inish. But I, I more and more don't watch movies over again because there are so many more that I still haven't seen. If you're really interested in, in learning more about film, uh, Mark Cousins, spelled just like Cousins, made a fantastic uh, documentary. It's 15 hours and it's called The Story of Film. And it's as good uh, um, a history of film seminar as you could possibly take. I remember when I watched it, I, I wrote down 40 films that I needed to see. And I've already seen a lot of films. It's, it's a great documentary. Turner Classics I was showing it for a while. So I don't know, lots of people go to film school. It's so expensive to go to school, as you, you and your families have probably noticed. And um, I don't know. I don't know if it's really worth it. I think in graduate school it's probably worth it, because there you meet your cadre, you know, there you meet your tribe. And more and more, do, do, are you aware of the Beasts of the Southern Wild, a movie that came out a couple years ago? I'm happy to say there are our protégés, and they're friends from Wesleyan University, the one that's in Connecticut. And they met each other in college and became Court 13, this group of people. And sometimes that can happen in college. And in fact, it's likely that you will leave this experience of four or five years, however long it takes you, with at least one or two people with whom you'll make your next thing. And so having a lively film or theater on campus, it's not so unusual that it would end up, as it did with us at Williams College, that you go off and make something else, which is what the guys who made Beasts did. It's a huge privilege. I mean, I'm sure you know how lucky you are to have four years to find out who you like and what you're interested in and who you might be next. The question is, what's the advantage of producing independently instead of Hollywood? Um, there was a producer named Mike Metavoy who described the process of making movies in Hollywood as being nibbled to death by ducks. Uh, if you have the temperament for that, uh, it's, it's a place where there's obviously much more money. And, um, and, much, uh, and, and that's where the ladder is. You know? And so if you want to climb up the ladder, that's the place. I look at the top of that ladder 
and, and I look at it for women, and first of all, they never get, you know, only four of them ever get beyond the second step. And the ones that are at the top are, to me, so sort of over-groomed and uptight that I just couldn't bear. Now, that's not a goal for me. Um, in, John started writing for Roger Corman, who is a creature feature. He wrote creature features. He wrote Piranha and The Howling and Battle Beyond the Stars. Um, that, that was the beginning of his career as a screenwriter. And at the same time, he, he met the directors. Joe Dante is one of them who made Gremlins. And, and we, we compare every now and then our career with Joe's. And we've made twice as many movies as Joe has. Joe, who's in Hollywood, where everything is heavily developed, heavily processed. And many are called and very, very few are chosen. And too often, when they're finished, the films are not the film that the filmmaker wanted to make to begin with. Do you know a movie called Girl Fight? Oh, it's such a good movie. It's directed by our former assistant, uh, Karen Kusama, who has a very scary new movie called The Invitation, which we saw last week at South by Southwest. Way too scary for me, but if you like wet your pants thriller, uh, The Invitation will be good for you. Um, the Girl Fight is a Michelle Rodriguez's debut, if you know who Michelle is, and um, Karen directed that movie, won the big prize at Sundance, and then didn't get another job for five years, and then um, directed <clears throat> Eon Flux, which you probably haven't heard of, or maybe you have, and then Jennifer's Body, and then finally just got to do The Invitation. And all the reviews are saying, Karen Kusama's finally back, and that's because those two middle movies were studio movies where there was so much interference and so much dissonance that Karn wasn't getting to do what Karn really imagined. Now Karn's getting to do exactly what she imagined and as horrifying as it was for me, uh, really succeeded in doing what she wants. So I think the main thing that I would say is there's a great opportunity because there's a huge amount of money and a great machine behind you to release that film. But it's very hard to get a movie through the system that has the authorial integrity that you get to have in independent films. On our movies, what does a producer do? In this case, this producer gets John complete creative control. So he not only, it's his screenplay and it's his final cut, and we cast exactly who we want to cast. And you just don't get that in Hollywood unless you're Steven Spielberg. So that's the difference, I guess. You know, every now and then I get a little wistful. But then, I'm so proud of the movies as they are, and that they really are what we tried to do. I wish we had more money, I wish I could say yes more often, I wish I could pay the crew a bit more, and you know, have a, people say, oh, it's such a fabulous set, we, you know, uh, Julia Roberts paid to have a massage therapist on the set every day, and I think, well, that would be nice, I would really like that. But I don't think I want to actually make that Julia Roberts movie, so it's, a, it's, it's the price you pay. And um, I just couldn't be happier, actually, that I didn't choose to work out there. I, don't, I couldn't be myself there. That's so much of what you'll be deciding as you choose where you're going to go next is, um, you know, will they let me be myself here? How much can I draw on what I know are my strengths and how much is this asking me to suppress who I am? and. Uh, and if I have something to say, can I say it in this job or not? I'm a terrible anti-authoritarian. Our company is called the Anarchist Convention. I mean, I've just had a question authority t-shirt that I wore as the producer on the set. You know, I've got major authority issues. So Hollywood would not have been a very good fit. What made me and John decide to work together? We fell into it. First, we fell in love in 1973. I met him through some college friends. He's a year older than I am. And uh, I met through some college friends in Boston, which is when I really found my tribe, because not only did I meet and fall in love with him, but he was living communally in groups of apartments with like 10 fabulous women who are my lifetime friends and who are the real Secaucus 7, the people that Secaucus 7 is really based on. Um, and I met him in October, and he asked me to live with him in January, and I moved in with him in June in 1974. And uh, we lived with a bunch of people, and then he decided he wanted to go to California and see if he could get um, screenwriting money. He'd already published two novels and a short story collection. Uh, busy guy, and a lucky guy. 
And so we moved to California. I cried all the way across the country because I'd never lived that far away from my mommy. Um, but I didn't know that's why I was crying yet. And, um, and we lived in Santa Barbara, California for two years. Uh, during that time, a friend from Williams College uh, who'd been running a summer theater that all these guys had acted in said, why don't you come back and make a movie here? Because Hollywood's moving kind of slowly. John was getting a chance to write screenplays, but nothing else. So, uh, not getting to direct. So, we came east to make this movie, and I helped. And it was before we knew any, um, like now, it's possible to get so much information about how to make movies. There's loads of books and lots of stuff online. I had a um, three-hole punch paper and a binder, and just started making lists, and that's how we started producing. And John had never edited before, and we um, and we went, to, we moved back to California to the, do the editing, and. We rented a van and loaded the editing machine into it, and he stole a manual from the from the house because he had no idea even like how to turn it on. Um, now you don't go, come in quite that ignorant, but we came in kind of uh, um, you know bold and ignorant, I guess. And working with him was fun. It was hard because we were also just working out living together, which is not an easy thing to do. I'm not a shrinking violet shy kind of person who doesn't know her rights, and John uh, is the boss, you know, so we had, uh, we, we struggled with our partnership um, as we did with our, our relationship, and now I think, uh, and we, in 2009 we finally got married, we'd been together for 34 years, now I have his health plan <laughs> through the Writers Guild of America, which includes dental. It's really it's fantastic. There's lots of reasons to get married, and that's mine. Um, and when people would say to me, um, congratulations, I'd say, you can congratulate me for the 34 years that came before, when all the push and pull is anyone who's been married, or if some of you come from parents, you've watched a, you've watched a marriage. There's a lot of push and pull in that, and John and I worked it out not only at home and in the kitchen, but on, in the field um, making these movies. But you can imagine that we had a lot of fun together going to all these places, and that we shared adventures. John was talking the other night, uh, every time that we hear about two actors who got married after meeting on a movie, you just think, oh, just have a little run of the show romance because the chances of you two actors actually getting to work together on the same project and having that fun, for actors it's slim. You know, they're usually off on different things. And Whereas John and I, every time I haven't elected to, to produce one of his movies, um, it's time spent apart that's not that good for us. He's having adventures on his own. I'm, uh, it's better for us to do it together. I think it's one reason we've been together for so long is that we've had so much fun together in all these different places, and we've made friends together. I know people say you shouldn't work with the people you love. For me, that's just complete nonsense, because my friends have brought me work, and work has brought me friends, and for me, it's just completely tied up. An astrologer told me that would be true many years ago, and he was right. Yes, Kathy. Full disclosure, we had dinner together last night. Well, yes, and it's a busy world, and I think it's a great world. It's like, the, it used to be that everybody was going to write the great American novel, and everyone we knew was working on a novel. And now everybody's working on a film. And it's so important to write, and it's so important to make movies if that's what you really want to do. But I think that the goal of having that lead to something else is um, a little dreamy because, um, which doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but you, it takes all the discipline of continuing to do it and if nobody wants to buy that book, you've just got to start writing another book. If that 
if nobody noticed that web series that you were working on or that YouTube that you put up, if what you really want to do is make movies, you just have to keep on doing it. And, 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 and that's really when you're a filmmaker, I think, or that's when you're really a writer, is if you, if you, if you, there, there used to be some of us who are older will remember on the back of some matchbooks was, do you have the, uh, an ad for a writing school? Do you have a restless urge to write? And I think if you have a restless urge to make movies, then that's then the internet is great. You can put them up on YouTube all the time. It's it's it, and it doesn't have to be super expensive now because of course the technology you truly can make a movie on your telephone. But I would say you can't confuse that for actually being on a a, a course of professional development because. Um, you got to be better at it than what you could do on your phone. You got to be able to enlist a whole lot more people, and you got to be able to raise a lot more money to get in in a in a larger public conversation, and certainly to be noticed by the people who will give you money, either private money. I mean, I don't think that we can make a movie for less than five, six million dollars because we work entirely union, and we um, often do things which are period. We have a certain standard of um, excellence that we demand so the, the crew have to be quite experienced and um, the, the, the issue for someone like me with the internet is that no one's actually figured out to how to as they say monetize that nobody's making any money off the, this internet thing yet now Netflix might be doing a webisode and it might look like something uh, a web series and it might look like something that is students making, but it's got Netflix money behind it. So there are actually still very few centers of um, uh, source money for anything that's large on the internet. It's still it's now like a like a playground, I think, and a good playground, and people are learning there. Um, but there's a point at which you have to just get in your car and point it towards New York or L.A. I think if what you really want to do is be a filmmaker. How are the independent uh, filmmaking things like in Austin or like Vancouver, like, um, are they more viable than New York or LA, or like, uh, is it easier to get financed there? How is that? Good? We were just the question is how, how about Austin or Vancouver? I don't know enough about Vancouver except as a place to get uh, film work. And as a place to get film work, it's still quite good. You have to be Canadian, but um, it's still, I think it's still quite good. Um, Austin, it really struck me when we were there last week, what a really friendly film community it is. If you do the time, if you're serious, the, Austin is a great home for you if you're a filmmaker. I met a guy um, who was a producer who had gone, to, graduated, I guess graduated from UT or someplace in Texas and then went to LA and worked in the mail room, did that whole classic trying to work his way up in the studio system. And after 12 years, he came back to Austin because it just wasn't going anywhere. And, um, and his girlfriend wanted to move to, uh, back to Austin. And in three years, he's producing because he really has the skill and the commitment and the talent. And that's a community that really helps. All the good things that you've heard, maybe about Rick Linkletter or Robert Rodriguez, about the Austin uh, Film Society, about <coughs> South by, that it really is a nurturing place. And I suppose, given my issues with authority, that would have been the place that would have been good for us to move. Um, and I'm not Canadian. Yes. Um, given that you said that the integrity of the film is really important to you but you also need a budget that is quite impressive. How do you um, keep the integrity and keep feeling like you are your own directive force, but still get the funds needed for the film? Yeah. Well, I fail sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I always do very well in the integrity department, but I don't always do so well in the fundraising department. <laughs> But we had, I could cheat and lay back on the fact that for many years John was a very highly paid screenwriter. He still works all the time as a screenwriter, but uh, across the board people seem to be making, being paid about a third less than what they were being paid. So we can no longer accumulate those millions of dollars as we did. 
but we, we funded Secaucus 7 ourselves in the early years, and then Liana, the second one, the brother from another planet, and then we fell into this lovely period of home entertainment when, believe it or not, you didn't always used to be able to watch a movie on demand in your house, right? Uh, VHS, uh, and then VHS was replaced by uh, DVD, and that was a time when um, there were actually companies that were in the business paying people like us, giving people like us money to make movies. And that was the, the golden years for us where we didn't, we could use OPM, other people's money. Yeah. And then, um, and then everything changed. So many things changed. Um, uh, the advent of the internet is certainly part of it. Hollywood getting bigger and stupider and only doing um, big, big hero movies, big superhero movies, and forgetting about a more adult audience. Um, lots of things happened so that uh, by 2003 or so, we started funding our own films. And, and now we don't have any more money because we did that. And none of the movies made um, a lot of money back. So, uh, so now here's a test for me. I'm going to try to raise money for this new movie, which is a high school movie set in 1890 at a boarding school in uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And it's um, Indian kids were sent at that time from their tribes all across the country um, to become Americans. The motto of the school was to save the man, we must kill the Indian. And so you think you've got identity issues. Uh, these kids, you know, they had their hair cut off. They couldn't speak their native languages. Um, they had to be on time and do all these things which were not their cultural norm. And it follows about 10 kids through this system, including the true believers, a couple of whom kind of turn around, and a couple of skeptics. And it's really good, I think. So how am I going to raise what I think is seven or eight million dollars for that? Um, by not thinking about the past, by trying to look forward, by having uh, delegating, by uh, taking on board a really wonderful Mexican producer, Alejandro Springal, who's become a good friend, who has learned in Mexico how to work the system really well. Unlike this country where we don't have a secretary for the arts and we don't have any funding for, any substantial funding for the arts, Mexico has all kinds of schemes, including one where uh, corporations, let's say Benjamin Moore, can, uh, let's say State Farm, they're so local. A State Farm could decide to invest in a certain film instead of paying that same amount of money as taxes. So um, Alejandro has figured out, uh, I, I'm pretty sure this will work, we'll do all of the post-production in Mexico. We'll do all of the editing and all the stuff we need to do in what used to be labs but are now basically digital offices and we'll hire a Mexican cinematographer, and we'll hire a Mexican uh, costume designer, and sh who's an old friend of ours, and she will make all of these uniforms in Mexico, and we'll try to figure out how to spend about $700,000 in Mexico, for which we'll get a million dollars from the Mexican government. I have to go to Mexico to get money for an independent film. I can't do that in the United States. We don't have anything like that. Then I'm going to go to the American Indian Tribal Associations, and particularly to their um, youth, uh, health, and education, and welfare departments. Because this is a movie that's really a lot about what they're all struggling about, which is um, youth empowerment, taking responsibility, understanding who you are. I think they're going to be interested in it. I've got some good friends who've worked generally in that field, so I'm going to try that. And then you hear about hedge funds bunch of rich guys who are together, who, can you imagine, have so much money that they'd be willing to invest in a, a one of our movies. Um, and then I'm going to go to Netflix and Amazon, because what they, and Hulu, because they're, they're just entering that game. All they really want is to get your name from that device that you're watching a movie on, so they can sell you other stuff. So I'm going to go to them and hope that they don't, I don't think they have that much stuff for young people. And they, uh, it's certainly pretty outside what they're doing. They're mostly doing, you know, obviously House of Cards. And, um, it's not a zombie movie, so, but on the other hand, maybe they don't want a zombie movie. So we'll see. I've just got my first feelers out to somebody at Amazon and somebody at Netflix. John um, is always going around pitching screenplays that he's hired to do. 
the, he gets paid sometimes, and sometimes the payment is deferred to go around and pitch, oh, a mini series about Louis Armstrong, or uh, for Morgan Freeman, he's doing something about Bass Reeves, who was an African American former slave, um, a federal marshal, so think True Grit, but with a black man on the horse. Um, that's at HBO. He went, he went to Hulu uh, recently. Hulu was just starting up one of these uh, places. I said, it was the meeting like he said, that you could still smell the fresh paint on the walls, and it was these two darling girls, he said, who I wanted to adopt. He said, they were so young and cute, and they didn't know what they were going to do yet, but they were happy to have a meeting. So, so I'm going to go to them too, the two cute girls that we didn't adopt, um, and see what's out there, because I think I've gone through a bit of a, I thought I was retired. I thought, oh, I'm just going to rest on these laurels that I have. How nice that would be not to be pushing the boulder up the hill again. And it's easy to get bitter when it was so easy for us for a while or so much fun. And uh, then my mother died and I got busy with all of that and skipped making this last very good movie with John, which is called Go For Sisters. So I've had a little time to cleanse and think about other things. So I've come back to it with some new energy. And let's see, I hope that, I hope next year you'll discover that we are shooting Save the Man in Port Townsend, Washington. We'll see. Oh, I could talk. And then in the third grade. <laughs> Thank you. Please give Mary to Mary the warmers as well.